rather than building the form from, from the ground up, what we're doing is looking, we, we explored ways to do this and we looked at how we could create the overall and then start to, start to break it down into the form that we wanted. Once we had these three elements, then we could start to twist it and explore what form made sense, what rotation made sense. Then we could quickly use multi-slice to be able to split that into the number of different floors that we were working with, and also a command blockify that identifies common patterns of, of in this case, floor plates, that then we could focus on one, we could isolate it, and then we could look at shelling it, basically just looking at ways that we could turn that solid into walls and, and other surfaces. And then once we did that, we were able to start to look at how we could apply um, ideas for glazing to it. And then we could apply that to all of the typical floors within that set. And this just gives you a feel for what it, you would obviously carry this design further, but to finish the other floors and the other block, blockified blocks that have been identified. But it quickly gives you uh, an idea about how you can go from that, from that first idea to start to develop the BIM. So now we're in the overall twisted tower. So obviously with this type of, with this scale of project, you're going to have um, numerous XREFs that are part of it because you'll have team members that are working on different parts. Uh, and in, in one of the cases, the floor is used more than 20, 25 times. So what we can do is start to isolate, we can isolate that floor, opening it from the quad. And then here we have just an initial representation of that, of that floor plate layout. We can start to create a radial grid. Peter, with the way that grids have been incorporated into Bricks CAD BIM version 19, what are some of the ways that we can use that? When you think of it, grids can be useful in many different areas. So we've seen Jacob create a grid on a vertical face of a wall to make a window. Later on, we'll see him creating grids on curved surfaces to make a curtain wall again. And here we see uh, a radial bin, uh, building grid. As you've seen, there's no dialog box. There's no grid editor wizard or anything. Because just like we allow any wall, any solid to be a wall, we also allow any curve to be a grid axis. And then the grid is just a block of uh, grid axis. And then you can rev edit that block and use any of the standard 2D tools to shape your grid in any way you want it. It's definitely not limited to a couple of choices in a combo box. That's great. So we're able to get a, a fairly complex grid in place pretty quickly. Now that we have this grid, let's look at how we can add the, add the column design, which is composed of multiple profiles and also a column base that's embedded into the, into the slab. In this case, the composition of the slab, the, the base plate will go down a couple layers to meet that to meet that point. So we ultimately need to create a void in the, in, in the slab to represent that base plate. And one of the things to note with the profiles panel is that here we can also make numerous selections if we want. We're obviously doing a structural element, so we'll choose structural steel. We can choose the standards that we want to work, work with directly, and then we can choose the shape. And ultimately, what can happen here is that now we can just drag and drop that into the model, and then we can locate that profile where we want it and, and create the height that we want for this, for this part of it. Then we can create another, select another profile, drag it in. And now we have our, our column composition. So what we can do now, because we have the grid associated with the project as well is that we can show how we can use propagate in another way. So we can select the base slab, and then we can select the components related to that column.
And then we can explore what options we have to now consider for propagate. So we didn't have to select the grid, but it knows the grid is there. And so since we had the column on the intersection of the grid, across that, that floor plate or that slab that we selected, which is not a rectangular shape, uh, we're able to see all the column options that are available. And so the ones that have the exclamation point are identifying that there's potential conflict in geometry between that and another element within the design. So we could, as you've seen earlier when we were doing the skylights, we can deselect those pretty quickly to build the set that we want to have associated with it. And then we can finalize it. And now we've got the layout for the columns, which is much quicker than if we use polar array or if we use copies. Um, it's allowing us to choose where we want. And as with all other uses of propagate, it's carried that detail around, directly modeled it to where it's removed that, that insert from the slab as well. Now, I see that we don't have one of the curtain walls laid out. So first, let's take a look at that wall. Because we're dealing with the twisted tower that twists 1.5 degrees as the building goes up. So as you might expect, this wall is twisted. So how can we apply a curtain wall to this complex, complex wall? Well, we can select the surface, and then we can utilize the curtain wall tool to establish the grid. And again, you can just enter the dimensions that you want. You can also uh, set parameters such as planarization, such as glass thickness, width, and depth for the curtain wall. And then when you complete that process, you've got that curtain wall for that twisted wall in place. So now we can save this typical floor that we've been working on. And we can go back to the overall BIM. And as we look at these floors, there's not, the columns aren't there yet, and the curtain wall hasn't been, isn't, isn't there as, as well either. So we can update that XREF. And the powerful thing is that now we're updating that for the 25 floors that are associated with it. So very quickly, we've got the columns in place, and we have the curtain wall there as well. So as we zoom back, you can see an area that obviously we need to do some work on. The, the twisted tower needs a dramatic entry to help deal with the twisted tower form and, and present it in the way that it, that it should be presented. So the way we can do this is by going to, the, to that XREF for that area, which is composed of multiple floors and has a lot of other XREFs already included with it. We've started to lay out the, we started to explore the form for what this could be and have curves already in place so that we could look at a lofted surface. But Peter, we, we mentioned that planarization is one of the properties or parameters within the curtain wall tool. How can it be used for this type of complex glazed canopy surface? Well, when we're, when we're creating a glazing system on such a surface, we first create a grid. The grid is based on the intersection points between the U and the V curves of that surface. And here's where plan and, and the four intersection points of each um, of these uh, curves uh, form a cell, and the glass panels will be based on such a cell. And that's when we, um, we have planarization. Uh, the grid is approximated in such a way that each four points of such a cell become coplanar. And when you have coplanar points in such a cell, you can have a planar glass panel with straight linear edges that, are, um, that fit nicely within the frame, which will also be based on uh, simple rectangular extrusions. On the intersection nodes of the panels, you can either choose to have a simple straight connection or you can make a smooth connection with, which will use lofted solids just to improve the visual of, uh, of the display. So if I understand correctly what you're saying with, with planarization, it's, it's a way that it provides a, a simplified way to approach this complex surface for what the glazing system that's created that 
potentially it could be more cost effective than if other approaches were used. Exactly. Great. Well, it's starting to look very interesting and very dynamic. So one of the other things, as we start to bring that back into the overall model and um, as we scale back, there's other things that we want to add. We'll obviously need to update that XREF that then we can start to see what the, the canopy design looks in the larger context of the tower. But as we scale back, we can start to look at some other multidisciplinary tools within this. We, we should probably put this building on a site so that it doesn't float in, 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 in the air, although we were talking about the next generation earlier. So we can use the Create Site tool. We can select Import from File. And we can select a coordinate file that we can bring into, into our BIM. So once this 10 surface is, is incorporated into the project, and the, and the coordinate file can be obviously obtained from a number of different sources. But we can start to change the, change the look and feel of this so that if you wanted to expose contours, change colors, other things, you could do that. Um, but ultimately what we're going to need to do, because if you look towards the Twisted Tower, it's, it looks like it's sinking a little bit um, because it has lower floors. And, um, and so we're going to need to explore ways that we can do grading on this to accommodate those lower levels uh, within the Twisted Tower. So again, this is expressing just that you can change the appearance of that once you start to bring it in. And um, there's obviously other tools that you can, you can utilize within this tool set as well. But so to accommodate for this and to add grading to this, we need to go to the underside of the building. So we'll, we'll, we'll take you underneath. And here we can select the, the bottom of that lowest level, the outline of the bottom of the lowest level. Then when we select the site surface, now we're able to adjust what the grading angle is uh, by moving the cursor around to expand or contract it. And we can also set a specific uh, dimension for that grading as well. And what we'll do is select the grading and we'll turn the boundary on. And when we do this, you'll get feedback on some of the, some of the, types of, uh, the type of data that you can start to, to learn about as you're doing this. So we now have a, a net volume and what that's calculated is the amount of soil that would need to be removed from that grading to accommodate those lower levels uh, during construction. And since we turn the boundary on, we can go back to the top and we can start to see how the, the extent of what that grading is influencing. So obviously that, that would be excavated first and then as construction moved forward, it would be backfilled in. Now let's also look at an, another example of adding a parking area to this layout so that it's going from the uh, entry area that we just developed with the glazed canopy and going to a, an overall parking area. So similar approach, we can, we can select the boundary for that and then we can select grading again and have the op option of picking the surface within the model and then we can start to explore the grading angle of that in the same way and set the dimension that we ultimately want or the angle we ultimately want. And so here we have another uh, graded area that's been defined. Uh, to, to clean things up, we can turn the boundary of this on. And again, we have a volume for what the quantity of soil would need to be to build up to that, to have the, the, the base of the tower as well as the parking area as well. So, one thing to note, we're also dealing with multiple angles and slopes here so that the parking area is down below where the main entry is and, and, and the ramp is going down. So it's just to express that you can, you can handle and work with this in a number of different ways. And as I mentioned, there are other, a lot of other tools that you can expand on and utilize to uh, create and work with sites. So now we've started to add to the context of what we have, but we should probably start to consider the systems, and the systems of the tower in a bit more depth. So now we can go to the 37th floor, and here we can access the current XREF for the MEP layout.
And what this is showing is the ceiling layout for this 37th floor as well as a air supply air distribution system that's tying to chilled beams. In this case, part of it's laid out on the perimeter areas. Um, the twisted tower has a circular core that doesn't twist, so it allows the services to go vertically in the building. But we'll, we'll start by creating a, a, duct, a main duct and a duct branch, uh, and we'll focus on the central space. So we can do this similar to how we started to create the, the, the profiles for the column. We can drag profiles in. We can just use the starting point, and then we can set the height for the first piece of that main duct. Oh, you can also rotate them if you want to change the orientation of them. So we'll do a multi-segment branch of this. Obviously, this would be tied back to the vertical, the main vertical, depending on how other things were laid out. But once you complete that, then you're able to see just the connection that's happened with those ducts. So you're not having to do it. It's already, it's already in place. Another thing that you can do is then you can start to connect it with uh, the existing ducts that have been laid out. So I mentioned that you'll see connect again. This is now the point when you see it, where you can select the two ducts and then you're able to connect it to that main branch. Now let's focus on how we can connect it to the chilled beams. So each of these chilled beams has a flow connection point associated with it. What that allows you to do is, is assign a profile to that component so that if we select create linear solid, then if we select that flow connection point, the profile that we start with is what's been specified with the component. Um, so if you receive components from, from other team members that you're working with that already have that defined, you can bring them in the model and start doing that right away. So once we have that flow segment in place, we can select it and then just simply connect it to the main branch duct. And you can also hit control to, to explore different options for that connection. So now that's just a few steps, pretty easy, but there's also an easier way that we can go about it. <coughs> so we could select all the rest of the uh, chilled beams and then select connect and connect it to that main branch duct. And so very quickly we have um, those nine other ones eight, if I could actually count right, um, connected to that main branch duct, even the end one that was past the end of the duct. So it's just to express that quickly we can start to lay this out and get a feel for the role it's playing in the design, and then, and then we could start to look at uh, how it, if there's any conflicts or anything with the current structural layout. So in this case, we could turn on the structural XREF or bring it into this DWG, and then we can start to zoom in and take a look at potential conflicts. And yes, the duct is too high and is in, is in conflict with the ring beam, which is obviously a pretty important design element in the overall twisted tower. So we need to explore how we can start to change that. So one way we could do it is by selecting that main duct and then splitting it into multiple sections. <coughs> So we can do that, and then once we have that in place, then we could select one of the surfaces of that main duct branch. And then we can use BIM drag, and we could start to move that duct around to see what makes sense. Now, Jacob's being a little bit ambitious in trying to go above the beam, which might pose a few more other issues. So we'll then start to bring it down to a height below the beam. And again, you're getting feedback with the, um, with the ruler and the scale as well. And then we could zoom in and check if we've been successful in creating some clearance there, which we have. But one thing to also notice is that the connections with the chilled beams went with it. Um, we didn't have to go back and make that change to the duct height and then touch each of the connections with the chilled beams. We were able to do that in one move. Peter, what are some other ways that these multidisciplinary tools have benefits in, in, in the overall picture of, of a project such as this? 
Well, I think one of the most important things is, uh, has been mentioned before, visual control. So by having uh, these MEP modeling tools, you can put quickly lay out a ventilation system in this building without actually being a ventilation specialist. And that allows you to, in a very early stage, see these problems and explore ways to fix them. Same thing goes for the other um, disciplines like the facade design. It allows you to very quickly explore how, what an impact a different um, glazing system will have on, on the visual side and also on the cost, as well as for the site modeling, when you know exactly how many uh, cubic meters will need to be excavated, you can have a very early idea about the cost.